Ready, huh? Yeah, here I think we have 13 or 14 cases of Omicron over the last weekend. Okay. Yeah, because some uh, students at um, university, I think they were having some party or something down south in Victoria. So one had Omicron and then, you know, there, there probably will be more cases of Omicron here in, in British Columbia soon. Uh, Zadab, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, we can start our program. About 90 students have joined. Right? Sir, shall we start? Uh, the way, sir, it seems to be busy talking. We'll start after he comes. Yes, we can start. Yes, we can start. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, good afternoon, one and all present over here. I welcome you all for the webinar on GSNST, a sky survey to search for astronomical transients uh, using an array of robotic telescope, an inaugural ceremony of Shivaji Space Explo Club organized by Physics Society and Shivaji Space Explo Club of Shivaji Science College, Nagpur. Before I move further, I would like to request Honorable Principal Professor M.P. Dhore, sir, to preside over today's webinar. Now, with the permission of Honorable President, I would like to move forward. I find that when you have a real interest in life and a curious life, the sleep is not the most important. Today we have with us as a guest speaker, Mr. Malhar R. Kendulkar. He is an observational astrophysics researcher based in Prince George, BC, Canada. I heartily welcome you on behalf of Shivaji Science College, Nagpur. Dear students, Dear students, participants and my colleague, as we know that an astronomical survey is a general map or image of a region of the sky that lacks a specific observational target. Alternatively, an astronomical survey may comprise a set of images, spectra, or other observational of, of objects that share a common type of feature. Surveys are often restricted to one band of the electromagnetic spectrum due to the instrumental limitations. Although multi-wavelength surveys can be made by using multiple detectors, each sensitive to a different bandwidth, so surveys have generally been performed as a part of the production of an astronomical catalog. They may also search for transient astronomical events. They often use wide field astro astrographs as well. So this Shivaji Space Explore Club of Shivaji Science College Nagpur from here on will provide a platform and opportunity for the passionate amateur sky explorer and astrophysics lovers to shape their dreams. Taking in account interest of our students, we, are, we have arranged this particular webinar. So now I would like to request Honorable Professor and Head of the Department of <coughs> SW Anwane, sir, for the opening address of this webinar. Please, sir. Good afternoon. Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I remember the great Maratha warrior Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, the king of the soil, and pay my humble homage to the founder president of Sri Shivaji Education Society, uh, Society's uh, former president, Dr. Bhausad Deshmukh, at the very outset. Respected principal, today's guest speaker, Malhar Kendulkar, faculty members, members of Shivaji Space Explorer Club, students of this department, uh, Dr. S.S. Darokar, who has uh, joined us for this program, and all student friends. Today, we are assembled here to listen to Malhar, 
who is an observational astrophysicist and is working as president of Prince George Astronomical Observatory, British Columbia, Canada. Mallari is going to talk about Global Supernova Search Team, GSNST, a, a sky survey search for astronomical transients using array of robotic telescopes. I am very pleased today because Mandhar is alumni of this college and is student of this department. He is the one who gave me a first glance at the sky to his personal telescope when he was BSc students of, student of this college and of this department during 2012 to 15. Malhar, your presence in this capacity will be inspiring to our students and making we teachers upright. This college came into existence uh, way back in 1967 and the college is accredited with A plus grade by NAC Bangalore in the third cycle. Also, this college is bestowed with College with Potential for Excellence by UGC in year 2004. Uh, Malhar, I remember a nazm by uh, Iqbal Asher and uh, is nazm ka kirdar hamare students hai aur hamara student Malhar hai. The nazm is as following, I am reciting this for you all. Mere beto, meri ungli na pakdo, meri aynak se dunia ko na dekho, meri nakshe kadam pe khaas dalo, meri raasto se raasta mat nikalo. Mohabbat ki nahi taksir nikalo, bulandi ki nahi tabir likho. Mohabbat ki nahi taksir nikalo, bulandi ki nahi tabir likho. Meri khwaish hai, tum ye kar dikhao. Chalo raktar kuch apni aur badhao. Tum se pichadne ka bahana chahata hu. Isme, isi mein jeet poshida hai meri. Mein tum se haar jana chahata hu. We want students to excel and go ahead of teachers. And that is what is written in this Nazm by Iqbal Asher. So, Malar, you are the uh, role model for students. So, we so have, we have, have made, 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 so we so have a learner pass out of our college who is doing very well, and that gives us pleasure and laurels to this college. In future, he will be, Malar will be a helping hand to the budding students of this college. With these words, I conclude my speech and uh, I hand it over to the comparer, Dr. G. L. Radhav sir. Thank you so much, sir. Being a part of this institute, it's been a truly a proud moment for all of us. Being a part of this college, I really feel very much proud for having such a wonderful personality, having an ex-student and as a guest speaker. Now I would like to request my colleague, Dr. Shahin Sayyad, ma'am, to introduce our today's guest speaker, Mr. Malhar Kendulkar. Please, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. A very good afternoon to one and all. At the outset, I pay my humble homage to the founder president of Sri Shivaji Education Society, Dr. Bhausab Deshmukh, I welcome you all to the webinar on GSNST, a sky survey to search for astronomical transient using an array of robotic telescopes. Today, we are very pleased to have our guest speaker, Malhar Kendulkar, president at Prince George Astronomical Observatory, principal investigator at Glooper Supernova Search Team, British Columbia, Canada, for this webinar today. GSNST, that is the Global Supernova Search Team, is the first sky survey in Canada dedicated to the search for astronomical transients. In 2021, GSNST consists of 10 astronomers from Canada, France, India, USA, and Argentina. GSNST telescopes are located in France, Spain, Chile, Argentina, USA, and Canada. It is an all-sky survey where the team scan the northern and the southern hemisphere with a cadence of three days to search for astronomical transients. 
such as novae, supernovae, optical counterparts of gamma rays burst, tidal disruption events, and optical counterparts of gravitational waves. So it's a very pleasure. Uh, it's a very pleasant to see the Malhar Kendukar sir, uh, uh, the chief guest of our today's webinar, and I am taking this opportunity to welcome our today's chief guest. Malhar Kendukar currently working as a president of Prince George Astronomical Observatory, principal investigator at Global Supernova Search Team, GSNST, British Columbia, Canada, a past director for four years, a national director of Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and a principal investigator of Global Supernova Search Team, GSNST. Malhar is also an instructor of physics, mathematics, and astronomy at St. Wauxia College in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. He is the first person in the history of Canada to search more than 90 supernova in a year. Today, Malhar sir is going to talk about the GSNST, a sky survey to search for astronomical transit using an array of robotic telescope. I am sure we will be enriched by this webinar. Once again, I welcome all of you for this function. And I have to speak some two lines for Malhar sir. Is that, Aapki manzil wahi tak hai, jaha tak aap himmat nahi aate. This is totally suitable for uh, Malhar Kendukar sir, the alumni of our college. And thank you sir, I welcome you uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you so ma'am. It is very it well said that if you want, want to be happy, set a goal that commands your thoughts, liberates your energy and inspires your hopes. When we are faced with difficult times as we are now with the effects of a worldwide pandemic, it is easy to get discouraged and lose hope. Hope is a vital component of human existence and it is needed to find happiness and peace during times that might otherwise lead us to be discouraged. However, there is a formula for turning your dreams into reality and it isn't dependent on who you know or providing yourself. And the formula is, of course, uh, obviously that goals plus commitment that will take you to the dreams. So dreams will come true. So without taking much time, I would like to request today's guest speaker, Mr. Malhar Kendukar, to inaugurate formally our Shivaji Space Explore Club and guide us on this occasion. Please, sir. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for for um, giving a beautiful speech, and I really appreciate it. Um, it is it is actually an honor to be here, you know, and I am grateful for the invitation to inaugurate the club and and share about um, who I am and what I do. So. Um, firstly, I would actually like to inaugurate, our, inaugurate the Shivaji Science um, Explorer Club, and I declare that this this club is inaugurated, and it is it is an absolutely um, absolute honor to be here. So, I will just share my slides one second. Okay, can everyone see the slides? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes? okay, perfect. So, uh, okay, one second. I think, uh, Malar, it is not visible. Your screen is yet not visible. Oh, my screen is not visible yet? Now? Uh, one second. Let me actually get this here. Share. Yes, now it is in process. Okay. It's visible. Uh, it's visible. It's visible. It's visible. Yes. Uh, Dr. Deshkar has joined. I think your mother uh, was also visible for some time. Yes. And it is a matter of really great pride uh, for teachers, parents, that uh, our boy is uh, 
having a deliberation which is a leading thing i guess yes okay you can go ahead okay so i am going to share my slides okay can everyone see the slides now yes okay um so <clears throat> um you know in today's talk i am actually going to talk about um some basics firstly about um optical telescopes okay and what are three major three uh, three optical telescopes which um astronomers actually use okay and then what are the different uses okay what are the impacts of of optical telescopes you know since since the first person who actually built the telescope um his name was hans leprache and we're going to talk a little bit about that and then the modern telescopes we have like big big major observatories in all over the in all over the world we're going to talk about that and what are the use uses of um modern major observatories okay so firstly optical telescopes um the telescope which um shivaji science club um explorer club has it so it's an optical telescope and that particular telescope it's called a newtonian reflecting telescope okay and <clears throat> um using using the, the the particular telescope um which is at the um college right now um the astronomy club um can actually look at a lot a lot of different things uh different objects in the universe in the space okay for example comets um some really really interesting stars um nebulae galaxies asteroids okay and planets moon obviously okay so an optical telescope what are optical telescopes well it's it's basically you know optical telescope is um is a telescope which is actually used to gather gather and focus light okay so <clears throat> there are optical telescopes okay well optical telescopes are actually used for astronomy okay and there are many non astronomical instruments as well which act, um uses optical telescopes okay for example spotting scopes for um people who you know um spotting scopes can be used for birding okay to look at the birds or um binoculars and camera lenses okay so these are all optical telescopes as well okay and when we are talking about optical telescopes they look like this okay but this is a big observatory and it has whole bunch of different instruments for different purpose and this is the observatory here um in prince george around 25 km away from my from our house um so <clears throat> most astronomers now it's funny because you know astronomy people think like astronomy okay you actually have to you know look through a telescope right but now astronomers um like me and my team members we actually never physically go to the observatory everything nowadays is completely robotic okay so we use machine learning we use lots of coding python to to program our telescopes and you know for to to understand whole bunch of different stuff like what really the instrument wants us to uh do and how the science oh, well the science we actually have to do using the instruments we have we have to actually program every single um bits okay but <clears throat> so this is this is really high level um astronomy but as of you know beginner i started so when i actually got into astronomy which was i think in in 2000 12 no, 2010 to 2012 somewhere around that time so i didn't had access to all these big observatories so i bought a small 70 inch uh, 70 mill millimeter refracting telescope okay which i actually used that to look at planets moons and and some galaxies 
you know, so looking through a telescope visually is is actually really fun. It's actually way more fun than than having the CCD data, the specialized um, astronomical cameras. Okay, so there are three main types of optical telescopes um, which we use. Okay, so the first one is it's it's a refracting telescope. Okay, which uses an objective lens. Okay, two objective lens and an eyepiece. Okay, and then the second one which was designed by Isaac Newton in, in, in the 1600s, which is called Newtonian telescope, okay? So the Newtonian telescope has a parabolic mirror, which is a M1, which um, we'll call it an M2, which is a flat secondary mirror at a 45 degree, uh, degrees inclination, okay? And then the light comes in, okay? B uh, bounces off from the primary mirror, which is M1, and then goes to the secondary mirror and then you see an inverted image because it's a mirror okay and that when you know with the eyepiece you have to focus the image and that focus is actually called a newtonian focus okay and the third one third telescope is called schmidt cassegrainian telescope okay which is which is kind of a complicated design okay um so a lot of amateur astronomers actually I know they they build their own refracting telescope and Newtonian reflecting telescope. Okay, so you can actually build these uh, telescopes at home. Um, so the Schmidt Cassegrainian telescope is actually advanced. Um, and these kind of so the the short name for Schmidt Cassegrainian telescope is SCT. Okay. So that particular telescope has one parabolic mirror as a primary mirror, okay, and then the hyperbolic secondary mirror, okay, which which will be at the prime focus, okay, and the Cassegrainian focus is always in the, um, um, then there will be a Cassegrainian focus. So reflecting telescope, Newtonian reflecting telescope, and and SCT are you know there are those telescopes are actually used most now for for all the research we do okay there are some disadvantages for for refracting telescope with the objective lens and the reason behind that is when you big when you build too big of a lens you know the, the lens actually get thinner on the edges so there is a high possibility that the mirror the the, the lens will actually break okay um, so there are actually a couple observatories which has um, really huge, large refracting telescope. So for example, this observatory right here is called the Yerkes Observatory, which has a 40 inch refracting telescope. Okay. Um, so there are, well, this telescope is now used for only for public. Um, they can't, they don't, use that for research anymore, not for science. Um, and so this is this is this reflecting uh, refracting telescope is really, really good for observing planets in our solar system. Okay. And then the next one we have, so this is <clears throat> this telescope is in La Palma Islands, Spain. So the name of this telescope is Grand Telescopia Canaries. Okay, and so this is a Newtonian reflecting telescope, reflecting telescope, and this is actually the largest telescope right now on an, um, on our planet. Okay, so the the diameter of the mirror on this telescope is ten point four meters. Okay, which is huge. Okay, so there is a comparison. There is a person standing. Um, right by the telescope. So that's one of the instrument um, of the of that telescope. So that instrument right now is on a Cassegrainian focus. Okay, so <clears throat> you can actually, so the advantage of, advantages of having um, reflecting telescopes, so you can actually shift the focus on the telescope. So you can actually go, um, you know, get the focus into a Newtonian focus and for a different instrument, you can actually sh um, shift the focus into a Cassegrainian focus, okay? 
So for example, in this picture, the, per the astronomer is standing right by the instrument. Um, so the instrument is at the Cassegrainian focus and it's a, it's a spectrograph. Okay, one of the most important um, instrument um, if we are doing the science, you know. So here's the telescope and if you want to compare the size of the telescope, so there is a car on the lower left side and that's the dome. So it's a huge, huge um, telescope, okay? And <clears throat> then the next one we have, it's, it's a Cassegrainian telescope, okay? So these observatory, um, this particular observatory is called um, Paranal Observatory. It's in Chile, okay? And again, this is a very, very large telescope. You can see the person standing under the telescope and then the telescope is firing those um, huge lasers. So those lasers um, are, um, they are not to, you know, call the aliens on our planet. <laughs> um, they are actually, they are called adaptive optics. Okay, so they actually create artificial stars to have an excellent guiding when we are observing really, really faint um, objects in the universe. For example, you know, like um, early galaxies, right? Um, or, or black hole in our Milky Way galaxy, right? So those adaptive optics actually clears the atmospheric turbulence, you know, <clears throat> because when there is a sudden uh, change in the in the atmosphere, it actually so there is a lot of turbulence when there is a change in the temperature, right? So those lasers actually helps um, keeping the turbulence low. Okay, so there's a technology um, for that. And if the telescope loses the guiding star when taking pictures, so those lasers actually create artificial stars to have, have better guiding. Okay, and these are the, well, that's a very large telescope, <clears throat> same observatories. And here's one of the instruments, which is, a, it, it kind of looks like a transformer from the movie, but it's actually an instrument. <laughs> okay, it's called MUSE, Multi-Unit um, Spectrograph Explorer. Okay, so that is the instrument um, astronomers actually used to confirm the um, Sagittarius A star, which is a black hole um, at the center of our galaxy. <clears throat> okay, so they did, well, you can't really see a black hole, but they actually saw the stars um, orbiting the supermassive black hole. Okay, so you know, when we are actually, when, you know, I'm talking about telescopes and everything, but so the small telescopes, when early astronomers like Hans Leprache, Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton, okay, when they built the telescopes and they didn't just build the telescope, they also did an excellent work on, in physics, okay? Um, so, um, you know, early telescopes have, even the, the, the smallest telescope, which Galileo Galilei actually use to to look at the look at look at the heavens you know it when he pointed his telescope in the universe it literally gave us a different um view of the way we look at the universe okay and because there were um lots of different theories around around Earth being center of the universe and everything around our Earth, um, well, everything orbits our planet, okay? Um, this theory was by um, Aristotle, right? But early telescopes have actually showed us that, well, Earth was actually not the center of our universe, right? Um, Copernicus model. Okay, and then Galileo Galilei proved it like, okay, well, the earth is actually not the center of our universe. Okay, and when 
Galileo Galilei pointed the telescope at one of the brightest um, stars, which he thought they were. He discovered planets. He discovered, um, confirmed those planets. Okay. Then he saw um, asteroids, comets. Okay. So this is the telescope which Isaac Newton actually built in 1600. So this is a first Newtonian um, reflecting telescope which actually uses mirrors okay and you know astronomers government space agencies um private um agencies they have been actually spending a lot of money in in this field in, ast in astronomy astrophysics okay so you know, we have been actually spending billions and billions of dollars now. Okay, why? Well, we are, you know, when we are actually building these large building size telescopes, you know, we are actually discovering extremely remote and high redshift stars and galaxies. Okay. And we have also discovered the largest black holes in the universe, which is called Ton 618. Okay, so that black hole has a mass of trillion times the mass of our black hole. Okay, so it's in a quasar, which is a very, very active galaxy, okay, which is pointing directly towards us. Okay, and quasars are actually one of the brightest object and one of the most energetic object, energetic galaxies out there in the universe. Okay, and big telescopes, technology, actually, if we didn't have technology, we wouldn't have, we, um, we really wouldn't have discovered all these things um, or known all these things we know now. Okay, so thanks to Edwin Hubble and Fred Zwicky. Okay, <clears throat> so, you know, we can, when we actually look in the past, so telescopes, you can actually call telescopes as a time machine, really, because your telescopes are actually helping you look back in time, okay? So in the universe, it's funny, okay, because we actually see everything as it was, not as it is, okay? Everything you see in the universe is in the past, okay? For example, if I'm talking about, hey, I discovered a supernova, which was, 350 million light years away, okay? So I'm talking about that supernova, that star actually died 350 million years ago, okay? And I captured the light of it, of a dying star, okay? But at the current stage, there is completely something different in that galaxy, okay? Um, then we can also try to um, prove the Big Bang, okay? But there, again, there are a lot of challenges to observe in that, that much past, okay? So unfortunately, we can only see 4% of the total universe and 96% of the universe is still out there to explore, okay? Does anyone have a question? Does anyone have a question so far? Okay. Um, then we can um, look at, we can discover, we can see exoplanets, okay, which is basically life in the universe, okay? Because, you know, in our own galaxy, which, so we live in a galaxy called Milky Way galaxy, Okay, and in our own galaxy, we have more than 100 billion stars, okay? And one more interesting fact, actually. So one of the theory um, suggested that there are more planets in our galaxy than stars. So let's say we have 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. So there might be 150 billion to 200 billion planets in our galaxy, okay? Um, so, and who knows, maybe 100,000 planets might actually have life, okay? So that's why 
and <clears throat> we have actually telescopes which were you know um which have been sent in space okay for example tess transiting exoplanet surveys um transiting exoplanet search survey or something like that test satellite or kepler space telescope okay so kepler space telescope ran its mission for 12 years and discovered 15 1500 to 2000 planet and out of those 2000 planets um 75 were earth-like planets okay so there is a high possibility that we will actually you know in the next decade or two um we know for sure that we will actually find life in the universe okay so there is a program there is an organization non-profit organization um based in the united states actually so it's called seti the search for extraterrestrial intelligence intelligence okay so they don't they don't really use optical telescope they use a radio telescope to detect the radio waves coming from the um you know from the planets if if there is a artificial um um radio signal so their radio telescopes are actually one of the most um, sensitive radio telescopes out there to detect the um artificial signals in the universe okay and they have actually discovered a couple of them okay just like um one of the signal is called wow signal um so i don't know what year it was discovered i think it was 1998 or nine something like that um using green bank radio telescope in west virginia so so that signal they know for sure um was actually from some alien planet some artificial um it was an artificial signal okay and there's there are ways that that um radio astronomers can actually you know um tell that okay well that that signal was actually an artificial signal okay so they have to do a whole bunch of like data reduction and and so forth and <coughs> excuse me so other uses of modern telescope is you know astronomical sky surveys okay so when you think of of um astronomers you know using big telescopes so most astronomers what they do they point in one part of the sky okay and they'll study one or two objects in the entire night for example right now we have 15 hours of night okay so um, some of my colleagues, um, so they will actually study only two or three objects the entire night, okay? Um, but sky surveys, so it's actually a survey, okay? So we, what we actually do, it's we point our telescope all over the place, okay? Meaning everywhere in the night sky, okay? So it's actually, so we call it as a systematic sky survey. So there is a, you know, um, uh, there is a way to actually scan the sky, okay? But there are people who actually just point the telescope anywhere they want, okay, in the in the sky. Um, so one sky survey called um, Dark Energy um, Sky Survey, okay? So that sky survey is actually looking for dark matter and dark energy in the universe. Okay, so supposedly dark ener dark matter, okay, so dark energy is completely different than dark matter, okay? However, we don't really know what these things are because we don't have enough evidence, okay? But, but theories actually su suggest that these two things are actually holding everything together, okay? Because some of the theories which um, were actually um, proposed about the universe, <clears throat> you know, were actually wrong, okay? So our understanding of the universe was actually completely wrong, unfortunately, okay? So now the theories are, you know, so the farther away we actually look in the universe, okay, the faster 
so the farthest galaxy, when we look at the galaxy, which are really far away, okay, let's see high redshift galaxies, or maybe the galaxy is 13 billion light years away, okay, which is almost the current age of the universe. So those galaxies are actually moving really, really fast, really faster, okay, away from, they're moving f away from us, okay, at a very, very high velocity, okay. And what will happen to those galaxies? They will keep mo they will keep moving away from us, and at at one point they will disappear. Meaning it won't be visible to our um, for the it won't be visible to the instruments. Okay, so we won't be able to see those galaxies. So, and this is all happening because of the dark matter and dark energy. Okay, so there is, you know, a lot of part which we don't understand about dark energy and dark matter so we are actually still struggling to understand like what really dark matter and dark energy is right <clears throat> and then there are surveys for dark matter and dark energy then there are astronomical transient surveys okay which are particularly focused on on transients okay so transients are so you know um, even in my talk i said gsnst a sky server to search for astronomical transients so what really are astronomical transients um so these are um very high energetic events which are happening in the universe okay but the transients could be really anything. The transient, the astronomical transient in simple words, I could say the, the objects which actually vary their, their, their light. Okay, sometimes they disappear, sometimes they appear. Okay. Um, so we'll actually get into that um, in, in a few moments. So there are a lot of um, sky surveys okay out there right now <clears throat> right now so the first one is called sdss which is a sloan digitized sky survey in apache mountain in, in new mexico so this sky survey has been going on for um 11 years okay and so these guys right um at sdss they're actually creating a three-dimensional map of the universe and you know and so this sky survey actually helped um a lot of cosmological theories okay because before we were thinking uh we thought okay that universe is just a flat plane you know like two dimension or one dimension okay um but the kinematics of the universe um are thought and our theories um were actually completely wrong so universe is actually three dimension okay but we really don't know the shape of the universe okay um, we actually will never know the shape of the universe because we don't know what is the center of the universe. Okay, we see universe as a three dimension. Okay, then another sky survey is called ZTF, um, which is um, from ZTF actually started in Caltech. Okay, it's called Zwicky Transient Facility. So it's actually named after Fred Zwicky. Okay. He's actually the person who started this branch of astronomy, okay, astronomical transients, okay. However, um, astronomical transients is actually a broader topic of, of, of a broader topic called time domain astronomy, okay. So then there is another sky survey called Assassin, which I was actually employed. I was I was an um, uh, I was working with Assassin. Um, so this is it's it's called All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovas, and then there is a Gaia space mission, which is which is run by European Space Agency, and then we have Hubble, um, Hubble Legacy Sky Survey. So Hubble Legacy Sky Survey was actually one of the most um, interesting sky surveys because the Hubble Heritage Team at um, Space Telescope Science Institute in California, um, they were actually trying to look for the, you know, most distinct galaxies, 
okay and that's how actually they discovered the hubble deep field okay so a single tiny part of the sky which is let's say maybe you know 30 pixels by 30 pixels okay and there are more than 10,000 galaxies in that tiny part of the sky okay and then hubble heritage team started doing that for for the entire sky for for 10 years and they found just you know galaxies and galaxies nothing else okay and the results um which they they published in 2013 that they said there are more than 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe and remember that number observable universe is only four percent okay there is 96 percent which we can't observe so 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe and more than 100 billion stars in each galaxy okay so the universe is big okay and then there's um, my um, Sky Survey GSNS team, which we focus, we focus on um, astronomical transients, you know, including supernovas, gamma ray burst, optical counterparts of gravitational waves. Um, we also look for novas, which are, you know, so when our sun will die, it will actually die in a nova okay and we also um study variable stars okay so variable stars are the star who actually change uh change their luminosity brightness okay in in particular amount of time okay and then there is a pan stars which is um a survey for asteroids comets and supernovas okay pan stars searches everything and then there's lsst which is actually which will be coming online pretty soon i think 2022 or 2023 which is called large uh, large synoptic sky survey okay and then there's euclid space telescope um, so Euclid Space Telescope was also a mission of European Space Agency um, looking for, um, uh, I think they were looking for high gamma ray particles, high, uh, gamma ray burst. So um, you guys are probably wondering, like I'm talking about sky surveys, okay, but why? why do we actually survey the sky what is the real what is the importance you know of survey the sky and what is the importance of scanning that much sky and having that much data every single night okay well there are actually lots lots of important and you know in 10,000 and let's say in 100 supernova discoveries one supernova can actually give us the information which we actually didn't had in the past about the universe so each supernova we discover could be actually an important discovery because you never know you can actually find you know some really really cool supernova which will actually which will be a new type of supernova okay so i'm going to explain what supernova is um in a few moments here okay so <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the main reason for surveying the sky, okay, is to search for transients, okay, such as novae, supernovae, gamma ray burst, and optical counterparts of gravitational waves. Okay, and also to know the intrinsic and extrinsic and uh, extrinsic details of any astronomical object. Okay, for example, variable stars. Okay, and there are um, different variable stars, um, intrinsic and extrinsic. Okay, so some of the variable stars are going through physical change. Okay, in their core. Okay, so there is um, a mass transfer happening inside inside the um, core of the star. Okay, 
so those those particular stars are actually called delta scuti so you know from one side they're actually expanding and from other side they're actually getting um they're shrinking okay so those are really strange um type of stars so in 2017 actually i discovered um one of one of the star like that um so the name of that star is gsc 0762-2924 so those are coordinates okay and you know another major reason to survey the sky is you know in contrast to studying a single object in the space we are you know, producing tremendous amount of data, okay? And right now, GSNST, um, our sky survey data is not public yet, okay? So we're gonna actually do a data release um, in in a year or two, because it's a, it's a lot of data. So every night, we usually get more than 20 to you know 50 gigs of data okay so and over or you know for three years so we have we have a lot of data and we we want to make that data public so everyone can actually access the data and you know <clears throat> they can find some some very very cool stars or or an asteroid okay and you know finding so supernova is actually is actually it's it's one of the most important um object to study in our night sky okay because type 1a supernova okay which i will explain um soon actually helped us understanding that the universe is actually expanding okay and it's not stopping okay it's expanding faster and faster each second okay so type one uh type one a supernova actually helped us um understand how the universe is actually changing okay and it can it also well some particular rare supernovas can actually actually help us understanding the formation of the universe too okay so here's what, um, so a kind of a overview of global supernova search team. Okay. So it is the first sky survey in Canada. Okay. Dedicated only, only to search for astronomical transients. Okay. And so we we started this team in 2018, August. Okay. So <clears throat> from here, from Canada and um, my colleague and a friend from France, Okay, so first in 2018, we we scanned, meaning we observed the northern hemisphere. Okay, because um, I live in north, 54 degrees um, north, and you know there is a lot to observe in the sky. <clears throat> okay, and. <coughs> Excuse me. So GSNST, GSNST actually grew in capacity by by three, okay, in, in 2019. And then we had five astronomers, um, astronomers from United States, India, and Argentina, okay. And in 2020, last year, GSNST became an all-sky survey, okay, covering both Southern and Northern Hemisphere, meaning we scan, we observe the sky, both the entire Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, okay? So we have more telescopes in North, but we have only three telescopes in, in, in Southern Hemisphere, okay? But that's enough to cover the Southern Hemisphere. <clears throat> and now um, we have 10 astronomers in 2021, from from Canada, France, India, USA, and and Argentina, so um, you know, and most of the astronomers here in in GSNST, they have their their own own um, instruments and and very expensive cameras. 
okay, to do science. So how do we really survey um, the sky? Okay, we need, you know, special specialized instruments. Okay, so first, here in Prince George, we have a wide field survey camera, which is on our 0.6 meter telescope as a part of GSNST. So right here is our telescope in Prince George. Okay. So um, I, I have observed also 70, 75% of the Northern Hemisphere using this telescope. Okay. And in 2018, I since 2018 actually this telescope has discovered 17 supernovas and three novas in andromeda galaxy which is the closest galaxy to the milky way okay and limiting magnitude meaning so in astronomy you know the things are a bit weird or i, would, I shouldn't say weird they are kind of um opposite to the you know real world so when i'm talking about magnitude Okay, it's the brightness. Okay, um, the flux of an object. Okay, let's let's call it brightness. Okay, so when we are actually calculating the brightness magnitude in the minus, for example, the brightness of the sun is minus twenty six point seven two. Okay, so when you go into minus, the object actually gets really really bright. Okay, and when you go into plus, okay, the object gets fainter and fainter okay when when you cross the 15 magnitude threshold then the object is it starts to get really faint okay so 21 magnitude is 21000 fainters than a human eye can actually see okay so that's really really faint Okay, and we are actually observing, we are actually discovering 21, 22, even 22 magnitude supernovas using um, different telescopes. Okay, so we are actually only <coughs> so GSNST and PANSTAR Sky Survey are the only two surveys which are actually discovering those supernovas at 21 and 22 magnitude. There are no other sky surveys which are, which are actually doing that. Okay. Um, so other main um, telescope which we use, okay, so we call these um, follow-up telescopes, follow-up observatories. So the first one is in northern Spain. So it's, 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 so that's a refracting telescope. Okay. Um, the second one is in southern southwest France. Okay, so that's a Newtonian reflecting telescope. Um, third one is inside a dome in Chile, which is a 17 inch, um, the type of the telescope is, it's, it's a, it's a type of a SCT, smith Cassegrainian telescope, which is called, um, tall Kirkham, Kirkham telescope. And then we have four, um, slow canaries, uh, Canary Islands observatory which has 20 inch and a 17 inch telescope okay and then we have oops um a 0.4 meter telescope 20 inch telescope in arizona sky village <clears throat> um another 0.5 meter telescope it also use british columbia and one in Quebec, Canada, again, 14-inch Celestron telescope, one remote telescope in Arizona, Benson, and another 14-inch in Quebec. So these are all our sky sur um, survey telescopes, you know, which um, some team members actually use to take the follow-up of the discoveries. Okay, and some some of the team member actually use the telescope to get the spectra of the discovery, okay? Meaning to classify what type of astronomical transient um, is, okay? So these are the locations <clears throat> um, of, of, of our observatories. So this is, um, this is called a sky coverage map, 
Okay. So sky coverage map meaning how much sky um <coughs> excuse me we are actually covering. Um so that's pretty much the entire sky. Okay. So in the cadence of three days, meaning every three days we are covering hundred percent of the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Okay. So here are some of the uh, details of how many galaxies we have actually scanned, meaning took pictures of. So there are more than 14,000 galaxies since 2018 we have taken pictures of in Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Okay. And to date, today, I, I actually changed this date today about um, discoveries. So um, so far, we have 199 supernova discoveries. Well, astronomical transient discoveries. So in those 199, there are gamma ray bursts, no ways, supernovas, all, all type of different things. Okay. So continuous scans um, in the cadence of two to three days. <clears throat> so that has actually kind of changed. Okay. Because of the, because in Spain, we have the 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 La Palma volcano is still still erupting. So the the telescopes have been off, offline for for eighty five days. Now they opened up since since three days, and in three days I found eight supernovas. Um. So, you know, we are surveying the northern and southern hemisphere every possible clear night down to magnitude nineteen to twenty two. Okay, so we point all our telescopes for 300 seconds for each target. Okay, and throughout the night, we have more than 200 targets. Okay, 200 depends, okay, depends on the sky conditions, depends if the moon is out, because when the moon is out, it messes up everything. Okay, um, I mean, sure, moon is it's beautiful good to, to look at. Um, but you know, moon moon actually washes out washes out the stars and faint faint objects. So, <clears throat> so here's a discovery map. Um, so this is not this is not a final version of the discovery map. I still have to add a lot of discoveries here. So this is actually one of uh, the the rough um version I actually made. So this was actually from the paper which um, we have been actually working on. So hopefully the, well, the paper will be published in, the, in January or February, hopefully. Um, so here you can actually see in a discovery map the, 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 the transient which we have discovered, they are all over the sky. Okay, not in a particular area, you know, not in a focus on one area, they are everywhere, you know, they're so well spread out. Okay, so that's the main um, the main major reason of of doing the survey of having an astronomical survey. Okay, you're actually having a good sample of the universe of supernova discoveries, you know, and using that huge sample of discoveries, you can actually learn that you know, how many supernovas are actually happening each second and the distances of the supernovas. Some of the supernovas could be really rare and very interesting. Okay. So, um, GSNST early science results. So how our data actually looks. Okay, so here's a picture of, of, of um, one of my discovery um, from last year. Um, so, in this picture, what you're actually seeing is so there is a galaxy, and if you guys can see the red marker, okay, so there is a DSS um, archival image, meaning um, the old picture, which, you know, you cannot see anything in that old picture on that marker, um, marked position right here. Um, and here in our sky survey data, something showed up and that that was actually a very very extremely young supernova okay i see there's a
question. Okay. Okay. So, you know, this is only um, a tiny sample of what we have actually worked on and have been working on since three years. Okay, here are a couple more discoveries from last year. Um, so we also look for quasars, okay, flares from quasars, meaning the, the, the black hole in the center of that galaxy is getting active, okay, and it's throwing off huge jets, okay, plasma jets, which are actually traveling close to the speed of light. Okay. And then our data can also, um, you know, as a citizen science project, um, anyone can actually go through our data and find their own variable stars. Okay. So, of course, I mean, um, the person will actually have to understand what variable stars are and what all these values actually mean. Um, you know, the mass, how to calculate the mass ratio of the star and um, BV index, the color of the stars and, you know, so on and so forth. So <clears throat> I've been talking about mostly supernovas so far, you know, and so what are really what are supernovas okay we have a um now you guys probably have a hint like okay it's an explosion okay one of the largest explosion in the universe most energetic explosions fine okay but but there is you know what really is a supernova okay so well a supernova actually you know occurs upon the death of a certain type of star, okay, certain types of stars, okay, not our sun, our sun is not big enough, okay, our sun will never go into a supernova, okay, so a star, if a star has to go, if a star, you know, goes into a supernova, so the star, the, it should be at least 30 times the mass of our sun, okay, um, so the word supernova was actually coined by Walter Bade, okay, on the left, and Fritz Zwicky. So Walter Bade and Fritz Zwicky were actually colleagues. Um, they used to work at Caltech, okay? And Fritz Zwicky actually is the person who actually started the Zwicky Transient Facility. Zwicky Transient, um, it's a survey, okay? So in that picture right here, you can see that Fritz um, Zwicky is actually sitting on the ladder and looking through the spotting scope on an 18-inch um, telescope at Palomar Observatories in California, okay? So that was his old telescope in 1970s um, and 80s, okay? Now, if you look at um, CTF Zwicky Transient Facilities Telescope, it's this one, okay? completely changed, everything is new. 1.6 meter telescope, okay? And this is actually the leading survey on our planet to, to look for supernovas, okay? Everything you see in this picture is a robot, everything, okay? Not the person who took the picture, um, but everything. There are absolutely no humans in, you know, working on the computers or looking through a telescope. Okay. So it's, it's actually pretty incredible. So you can see since, you know, the telescope were built in, in 1500s by Hans Le Prichet, And now here we are that we don't even need humans to look through a telescopes anymore because machine learning and, um, and artificial intelligence can do that. Okay, so how a supernova looks in real life, if you see it, if you see one, well, here it is, one of the picture um, of a supernova called SN2017 EAW, okay? Um, so SN stands for supernova as an acronym, 
2017 is the year it was discovered and then EAW is the alphabet, you know, so it goes from um, AAA and then AAB and so on. Okay, so every year, um, Sky Surveys actually discovers, you know, the total number of supernovae each year discovered is more, more than 15,000 supernovae every year. So that's a lot. That's a large number. So you can imagine how many stars are actually dying every day in the universe. Okay. Um, so what causes a supernova? Okay. So, um, so a supernova happens, you know, where there is actually a sudden, okay, there is a change okay in the core of the star meaning the the nucleus of the star okay and that actually change can happen in two different types okay which can actually result a super uh, result a supernova okay so there are there are actually five different types of 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 supernovae okay and uh, well the the other three we actually don't really understand them well because um there is not enough evidence okay only one or two supernovas actually have been have been found for those those kind of different and weird type of supernovas okay so the common ones are type 1a okay so what is a type 1a supernova well it actually happens in a binary star system okay um another thing so in the universe or in our galaxy let's say 50% of the stars actually come in pairs, okay? Um, and 50% stars are single, single star systems, okay? Meaning in pairs, you know, it's um, more than one, one, two stars, or there are sometimes quadruple star system, okay? So type 1a actually occurs in a binary star system, okay? And these are the most interesting one because remember this this kind of supernova actually tells us the expansion of the universe, okay? Um, and when we actually discover this, we can actually calculate the velocity um, of the 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 um, radial velocity. Okay, so this happens when binary stars well binary stars are two stars orbiting orbiting one another, okay as the name says okay and so in type 1a supernova so there is binary star and one star should be a white dwarf star okay white dwarf stars are small but deadly dangerous very very dense okay and one is white dwarf and other star of a binary star system could be really anything from a giant star to even a smaller white dwarf okay it could be really anything okay so like i said white dwarfs are dense so they have more mass okay and more gravity so they actually steals matter from its companion star okay and when the white dwarfs actually the white dwarf star actually gets full, it cannot actually really handle anything anymore. Okay, and then guess what happens? Um, the white dwarfs actually explodes. Okay, explode and results into uh, resulting into a supernova. Okay, that's what type one type one a supernova is. Okay, so here's the remnant of type 1a um, supernova it's called um, it's called a ring nebula okay and when a star explode it explodes it actually um, pushes out all its all its you know hydrogen helium and other ionized gases right and you can actually see that in the spectra on the um, bottom of this picture there is um, hydrogen alpha um, hydrogen gamma, beta, um, then helium, and hydrogen delta, and, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, Malasa, Malasa, yes. uh, 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 if 
you could uh, uh, end up the uh, session uh, within five minutes, minutes, so minutes, we could have uh, we, we would have some, have some uh, interactions with students or as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. That would be better for us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Please. So white dwarfs are, it's a very dense, uh, dense star, okay, and its mass is, you know, the mass of the white dwarf is comparable to the sun, um, comparable to that of the sun, okay, and the volume is comparable to the earth. So you can see that white dwarfs are really, really dense, okay, here's a comparison of sun and white dwarf, okay, so there's a sun and on the right side, there's that tiny white dwarf. There it is. Okay, so it's pretty interesting how um, how how deadly white dwarfs are. And this is a picture of another supernova. So type two. Okay, so type two supernova actually occurs at the um, end of a, a single star's uh, lifetime. Okay, and these are another interesting supernovas, which. Um, you know, so the star actually runs out of nuclear 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 fuel. Okay, and some of its mass actually flows into the core of the star. Okay, and when the core actually gets too heavy, it actually gets destabilized, unstable. Okay, and this process happens really fast. Okay, so this kind of super, this type of supernova is also called a core collapse supernova. Okay, and for this supernova, the star must be at least 40 to 50 times the mass of our sun. So, um, and why study a supernova? So, it's, it's, supernova actually burns only for a short period of time, okay? But it can actually give a lot of information about our universe, such as expansion, okay? Expansion of the universe, and by discovering the high redshift supernovas, it can actually give us the, <coughs> um, excuse me, or um, formation of the early galaxies. Okay, and so we report all our discoveries publicly. Okay, they are available for for um, public to see, and we report in a website called Transient Name Server. Okay, um, so it is actually run by um, International Astronomical Union. So here is a um, small graph of um, GSNS discoveries. So. Blue ones are supernova discoveries and red ones are false positive, which we actually don't report the discoveries anywhere. So today at GSNSD, we are actually developing a transient search pipeline, okay, automated pipeline, okay. And to date, in 2021, um, so far I've discovered 83 supernovas and the target is 100, it was 200, but I, change it to 100 because I know I can get to 200 right now because it's almost end of the year. Um, and we are also looking for um, research grant to set up robotic telescope in Northern British Columbia, you know, to advance the search for supernovas and GRBs. And in summary, you know, we will progressively survey the sky in both North and Southern Hemisphere, hoping to discover more rare supernovas, okay? And yes, so we will actually make the data um, available for public very soon, um, hopefully by, by next year, okay? And everyone can take a part in this project. And I'm, I'm, I'm open to, to have, um, I'm open to take projects as well. Okay. So that's, I, okay. Any questions? Uh, dear students uh, and participants, now it's time for uh, interaction session uh, with our guest. If you have any queries, uh, questions, please, uh, you just go ahead. You just unmute yourself one by one and ask your queries, please. Hello, sir. Hello, Malar, sir. Hi. Uh, I'm Roshni Pauza. Hi, I'm nice to meet you. I'm not you any afternoon because I know you are in some different time zone. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> and I am also a graduation student from this college itself. So that makes you my super senior. 
and uh, my question is to you uh, personally i would say ki uh, you were the geology student in this college then how did you find your interest in astronomy well because i was actually well i was that's a good question so i was a geology student yes and so i actually had interest in astronomy since you know i i was a kid okay, okay. but um so when i was in shivaji science college so in my physics course first year physics course i actually had a topic in um on the first chapter or second chapter was um on astrophysics introduction to astrophysics Yeah. okay and then when i you know started doing that chapter in physics then i thought okay well that's i want to actually do so i actually developed my interest more um when i actually started doing the 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 astrophysics chapter in our physics course at shivaji science college so okay that's very nice to hear and also sir about your own discovery it was very inspiring but uh, what did you how did you discover the pulsating star is it rare something um so for the pulsating star is actually good that's a great question um so <clears throat> you actually have to learn the light curves you have to actually look at the light curves okay meaning so we take hundreds and hundreds of pictures of the same star okay um and then you have to do the magnitude calculation of the pitch, uh, of those pictures okay and when you do that you can actually see that the brightness of the star is actually changing in let's say two and a half hours um 0.092 days okay and when you do that you get text files okay and you, and, and you plot those text files and you can see like beautiful curves okay in in your in your graph okay so a lot of bright pulsating stars have already been discovered now because of the other sky surveys but the stars which are 13 13 plus magnitude they are still um yet to be you know discovered and our sky survey actually allows um everyone to actually discover those 13 plus magnitude stars because we actually go in the same region of the sky time to time so but we just don't have enough time to really analyze that big of a data okay okay so uh, that was great uh, so actually you might have designed uh, any type of telescope by your times right pardon me uh, you must have designed any type of telescope right no i no i didn't no. see the one no no i i was actually planning to but i just never got around it i actually wanted to do it i wanted to build a telescope but maybe in um a couple of years or maybe next year i or maybe in christmas break <laughs> um, i might be looking for that in the google okay in my new times <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> yes sir uh, and actually i am thinking of designing a cassegrain telescope so i would like your tips about that yes absolutely yes that's cassegrain telescope absolutely definitely i can i can help you so uh, can you say share some of the details where should i start from um so firstly you'll have to get um parabolic mirror um okay. from um from one of the stores so i know one person in india um his name is raju patel he lives in okay. mumbai so he has a website called um here i'll actually share it www.com um so hopefully that website works um so he has parabolic mirrors in his um in his store and or you can actually build a mirror by yourself as well but some name was crashing tejraj okay hmm? tejraj 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 yeah some supplier from pune yes so that's why yes. members of you for sharing yes not a problem so and uh, yeah you know and then you have to decide like how big of a mirror you you want right mm -hmm. but mirrors are how much magnification around you is just uh, it would it be suitable for me which magnification would be suitable for me well so the basic i'll say 
around five to six inch telescope it's it's good for good for the start okay okay and uh, nowadays the so the thing is um building telescope is actually more expensive than buying it, <laughs> it is <laughs> yes it is but it makes a person creative right it does it does yes <clears throat> Um, and Cassegrain telescope is actually really fun, um, fun to, to, to build. Okay. Because, um, a couple of our observatory members here in Punjab, they have actually built a Cassegrain telescope and you do get really good results from that telescope, right? The, the, the pictures, mm -hmm. um, are sharp. Okay. So, uh, is it possible that I can have all the instruments of a uh, refracting telescope, Newtonian telescope, in one telescope? It, um, it's a silly idea, but is it possible? Um, I don't know. That's a uh, hmm. And it's very no, because it it will be really complicated because for refracting telescope, you're actually using the lens. And exactly. Cassegrainian, you're you're using you know two mirrors, and for Newtonian, it's again two mirrors. Mm -hmm. And then if you do that, then you'll actually have a a lot of. Um, it will be too complicated as a design. Okay. Okay, that is considered. Okay. Uh, so, uh, last question. Yes. So, uh, you showed the design of the Cassegrain telescope. And yes. The, uh, the concave mirror there was uh, converging, I think. It should be diverging, right? But it converges in the Cassegrain arrangement. It does. Yes. So, it's I a hyper, hyperbolic mirror because it actually gets, uh, when, you, when you have a hyperbolic, it actually gets the focus into a back focus, meaning um, the uh, prime focus. Okay, so that's the speciality of having a Cassegrainian telescope. So you can actually fix a camera. So those kind of telescopes are actually actually called astrographs. Okay, okay? and mm -hmm. which are actually used specially used for, um, you know, taking really fast um, astronomical pictures of the sky. And so it's actually called a rapid astrograph. Okay. Um, so you can actually attach a camera in front of the telescope, okay? Not like other other telescope in Newtonian. You have to attach the instrument on the right hand side or the left hand side of the telescope, right? Or in the back focus. So in the Cassegrainian, you can actually attach a camera on the front, which is called a prime focus, okay? Or you can also call it as a hyperstar. So that's why. Oh, okay. Got it, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, it, feels you. it feels really pleasurable to have my answers from all the way from Canada. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you so much for asking the questions. Yes, sir. Any student want to pose a question? Sir, I do have a question. Yes, yes. yes. Hello, sir. I'm Manoj Gadate. I'm a student of MSc Physics first year. Yes. Hi. Sir, as you mentioned, for a star to go through a supernova type 2, it needs to have a mass 20 times as that of our sun. Yes. And type 2, considering, yeah. yeah. Considering our star, it is a single star and it doesn't have enough mass. So what kind of end can we expect our sun to go through? When that's so that's... Cube? That's a that's a good question. So what will happen to our sun? So our sun is, um, is a small star in the universe. Okay, there are much much bigger stars in the universe than our sun. So what will happen when the sun will die? So the sun will eventually expand. Okay, it will it will get bigger. Okay, and um, unfortunately, it will actually get bigger. I mean, it will. The, the diameter of the sun will actually ca close to the orbit of our Earth. Okay, so yes, of course, the Earth won't be alive. The, no one will be. <clears throat> um, so when the sun will actually get bigger and then 
so it's actually it, the sun will be at its maximum capacity okay and when that happens the sun will actually start losing its mass slowly and slowly okay and eventually when the sun is losing its mass it's actually releasing all um all the um you know major chemicals major um um yes elements from the sun which is hydrogen and helium uh, right and eventually after that after um, maybe 100,000 years later, the sun will actually turn into a white dwarf. Okay, and when that happens, then the sun, well, the sun will actually ex ex explode, okay, and then start losing its mass slowly and slowly, and then eventually it will turn into a white dwarf, okay? And if if the white dwarf actually, you know, so some of the white dwarfs are very, very interesting. They can actually explode time to time if they have a companion, but it won't really happen anything with, with our sun like that. Mm -hmm. But yes, our sun eventually will turn into a white dwarf. So essentially it will expand and then contract. Yes. So in the initial part, it's essentially a type two supernova. No, it, it won't be a, 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 a no, no, our sun won't actually increase its mass. It will increase its diameter. Okay, type two supernovas. So the type two super type two supernovas should have a mass of at least twenty to twenty to forty times the mass of our sun. Okay. So our sun is not really changing a whole lot of stuff inside it, inside the nucleus. Okay, everything is happening in the photosphere of the sun, which is the outer part of our sun. Okay, hydrogen is turning into a helium. Okay, and um, and when that happens, well, yes, the core actually gets destabilized. Okay, but the star, if we are talking about particular type two supernova, the star should actually have a very, very high. The star, the the star should be a high mass star. Okay, our sun is not a high mass star. Okay, and you can we can actually see that in a Hertz um, Hertz per Rus, um, Russell diagram, HR diagram. Okay, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. So, anybody else? Uh, any questions? Yes, um, there is a question. So my name is Slavkish. I'm a student of BSc semester three. I have an interest in astronomy from childhood. I have read multiple books of Jayantanarikar. My favorite topic is Quasar, but not other books or web have much information about it. Can you please tell us about, a little about Quasars? So Quasars, um, they are, you know, really fascinating objects, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Quasars are basically quasars are galaxies, okay. But um, you know, not every galaxy actually has a very very active black hole, okay. That's what ma uh, makes quasars really interesting and cool, okay. So quasars have huge, very very big supermassive black holes, okay. Much much bigger than our Milky Way galaxy's black hole, okay. And those black holes are active, okay? Meaning <clears throat> they are constantly eating stuff and then throwing stuff outside from the event horizon, okay? Um, and also quasars are one of the brightest objects in the universe, okay? So, for example, if a quasar is like, um, you know, well, they're actually one of the most distinct objects in the universe, okay? They could be like billions and billions of light years away and they could be really bright. Like bright meaning, I'm saying like maybe 14 magnitude, okay? So one of the first quasar which was discovered in, um, in 1998, it's called 3C273, okay? Using Hubble Space Telescope. So that quasar actually looked like a star, okay? It had nice diffraction patterns, okay? But then by getting the spectra, people saw that there is a huge blue continuum lying in the uh, lines in the spectrum, right? And then they saw that, okay, there's something really strange going on with this because it was actually throwing off jets, okay? And it was pulsating, meaning the brightness was actually keep changing, 
Okay. Um, you know, and again, the Sloan Digitized Sky survey has found more than thousands and thousands of quasars in the universe, which are um, at a very high redshift, early formation, early quasars in the universe, and billions and billions of light years away. Okay. So they're actually pointing, those quasars are actually pointing directly towards us. Okay. As, um, towards us, okay, directly parallel, mm -hmm. okay, if a quasar is um, the um, accretion disk of a quasar is pointing, um, you know, 90 degrees, um, we actually won't be able to see it, because the dust is blocking all the view, okay, in the um, accretion disk. But if the quasars are pointing directly towards us, then we can see them. Uh, thank you so much, Amala, sir. I'm truly overwhelmed. It's been an amazing and wonderful webinar. Uh, you took through us, uh, you, took, you just took us through all the details. We really have enjoyed this session very much. Uh, being a faculty member, I was also uh, so much curious about the topic and uh, this astrophysics and all. And I tell you, uh, you have literally created a knowledge right from A to Z for all of us and our students as well. Uh, telescopes, optical uh, telescopes, types of telescopes, and impact and uses of telescopes. You are just taken through the fundamentals of astrophysics. So thank you so much once again for being a part of this uh, Shivaji's uh, Space Explore Club. Thank you so much for giving us time. Now I would like to uh, request our Honorable Principal, Professor M.P. Dhore, sir, to address this webinar. Please, sir. Thank you, Jadav, sir. Our today's young and dynamic resource person for this webinar, Mr. Mallar Kendurkar, head of the department of physics, Professor Anwane. I can see here Professor Darukar, sir, attending this webinar in the department of physics. Uh, Professor D.W. Deshkar is also with us to witness his students uh, as a to, to witness his student as a guest speaker. Uh, then all the staff members of the Department of Physics, Professor uh, Jadav, Madam Dhopne, Madam Sayyad, and all the teachers of our college and all the students of physics department and all the members of our Shivaji Space Explorer Club. A uh, very good morning to uh, good uh, morning to Mallar sir and a good afternoon to all of us. In fact, uh, firstly, I apologize uh, 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 Mr. Mallar sir for having or for choosing this very inconvenient time for the webinar. In fact, it's uh, morning uh, 3 a.m., 3 or 3.30 a.m. in uh, his place. And uh, he has been uh, speaking with us since uh, half an hour. And I really thank uh, Mallar sir for <laughs> enlightening us with his uh, uh, odd time and sparing your time sparing your right <laughs> in fact with all of us for all of us but uh, at the same time i am happy that mallar sir being alumni of our college he must be very much happy to share his views with uh, the alma mater with the stakeholders of the alma mater and the same feeling is with uh, us sir we are also happy and taking pride and privilege by having your interaction with all of us. Uh, actually, being a Shivajian and that too from uh, Canada, you are talking with all of us. Uh, it, it's a very proud uh, feeling for all of us that one of our student is uh, doing wonders in Canada and he is uh, leading uh, 
प्रिंस जॉर्ज ऑब्जर्वेटरी इन कैनडा एंड डूइंग वंडर्स बिकॉज इन यूर इंट्रोडक्शन आई हर्ड दैट यू हैव सर्च नाइंटी सुपरनोवा इन अयर and you are the first one who has searched 90 supernova in a year so that that was that is a great uh, achievement as far as uh, our uh, alumni and our shivajian is concerned so a uh, big congratulations for that mr malla and you are doing very good uh, work in in terms of observational astrophysics uh, Uh, still uh, you are researching on that and we hope that uh, in the coming years you will be having your phd at the earliest and as far as the department of physics of this college is concerned recently in our college we have formed a shivaji space explorer club under the leadership of professor anwane and under that club we have also procured recently a telescope and hardly it, it had been one and half month that we have procured that telescope and as after procuring procurement of the telescope we are neophytes <laughs> nobody is there to handle the telescope so it was a great worry for our professor anwane that uh, we should have some experts expertise and uh, with the consultation of some expertise we will explore uh, the activities at our space explorer club and fortunately uh, he came came up with uh, your webinar and today i i found that we have the we were in search of some expert and we have got our own expert <laughs> in our family so that way i am very happy and uh, must be professor arman is also happy that uh, we have got some expert to advise us to guide us in this particular front so again uh, the credit goes to professor arman and the staff members of the department of physics i congratulate all the staff members of uh, physics department for having this particular webinar on this particular topic uh, and uh, it was really a feast for all of us it was a very quite uh, general topic but the interaction which you had with us that obviously uh, was a good uh, uh, interesting one and as we are having a telescope at our college now we are planning for some more activities under your leadership and obviously we will be having some mou with your observatory and we look forward to have some collaborative work with uh, your observatory and our college absolutely and finally thank you mullar sir for having with us thank you for sparing your time and i take this uh, opportunity to thank uh, all the staff members from the department of physics for having this wonderful interaction with all of our students also thanks to dr deshkar sir and darukar sir it was uh, nice to see you here and with these words i take your leave thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir it's really been a matter of pride for all of us uh, that one of our ex students have now been a guest speaker it's truly a, a proud moment Uh, my best wishes to malla sir and hope you will collaborate uh, with us in coming future as well and thanks for giving us your valuable time uh, now we are moving towards the end of the session uh, without taking much time i would like to call upon uh, my colleague uh, miss roshni auja to present a vote of thanks uh hello and very good afternoon to all actually hello and very good evening to all the respected and distinguished personalities dear students and everyone gathered over here it is my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks for today's program i roshni pahuja on behalf of the entire fraternity of the college first of all extend my hearty gratitude to our today's webinar speaker malha kendalkar who is president at prince george astronomical observatory principal investigator at global supernova search team gsnst british columbia canada 
for eliminating us with his knowledge despite his busy schedule also uh, we are fortunate to have such a renowned identity with us who pursued his graduation from the same college the point uh, where he told us about his own discovery of pulsating star did really leave a mark on us thank you so much sir i would also like to thank our principal dr mp dhore for giving us permission to organize this webinar session and his continued support in all our efforts next i owe special gratitude to the head of physics department dr s w anwane for his kindness hospitality encouragement and his leading supervision at every point of time in the college also i extend my sincere thanks to dr s s daroka and dr deshka for being with us today further i express my heartfelt thanks to our today's host dr gajanan jadav for his efforts towards today's anchoring I also wish to thank all our teachers present here for their cooperation. Also, thanks to all the participants for attending the meeting. Uh, finally, I leave you with this relatable, relatable quote by Elon Musk: "When something is important enough, you do it, even if the odds are not in your favor." Right? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, before closing, yes. yes. Before closing, Malla, I would like to uh, uh, invite you uh, somewhere in the mid of January, and uh, there you will be guiding to limited students, uh, MSc second year students, for data analysis. So, yes, so we can. Yes. Special session, and uh, we will have in due course of time we will have our MOU signed. Okay. Under the guidance of our principal, we shall prepare documents, and we will have that signed. Okay, absolutely. So yes, thank you, thank you so much um, for inviting me. It was you know really great um, meeting you all and seeing everyone. And <laughs> excuse me, I I really appreciate the. Um, it is it is an honor to to give a presentation for um, for my college. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I hope to soon um, see um, everyone very soon. Okay. okay. Have a good night. Um, have a have a good afternoon. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Good night. Bye. Good night. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.